Hello everyone and welcome back to Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong on a very special day for a very special movie with a very special guest and my incredibly special co-host, Jacqueline Coley. Jacqueline, you're here, we are back, and the question remains the same. What did you have for breakfast this morning? <laughs> As always, it was a big heaping glass of air because I Just don't nothing. believe it. You, you do nothing. Water? I mean, that's good. I think you're supposed to drink water like 30 minutes before you do anything else that you take in because it's like better for, I don't know, you know, we're we were talking about cereals and how they are really forming our minds as far as how important breakfast is. But I still do it every day. No milk, just dry cereal. Yeah. I mean, you fell for the propaganda, but that's not a bad thing. Everybody does. I, was I believe, drinking that honestly. Coolly. Breakfast is not the propaganda as much as orange juice. Orange juice <laughs> is the devil's cocktail. I'm sorry. I don't like it. California people, you can come for me if you feel I'm a great girl. Brunchers are going to come for you. No, grapefruit juice. A mimosa is better with anything besides orange juice. All right. Well, at least we can all agree on this, is that if you have to have a meal, the most important meal of your day is Pizza the Hut. Or just pizza in general. <laughs> pizza is always the best meal of the day. And I consider this movie to be the Pizza the Hut of films. Not just because it actually stars a character named Pizza the Hut in one of the all-time great visual gags. It's also just because it's funny. It's important. It is a cornerstone of my childhood. And I hope a lot of other people listening right now. It's the 1987 Mel Brooks directed classic Spaceballs, the parody of Star Wars and space operas and a lot of other science fiction and nonsense thrown in there. This movie seems divisive these days, and I have no idea why. And the tomato meter is a prime culprit of why Spaceballs is, for some reason, lost on today's youth. It's our job to get them back because it's currently 56% on the tomato meter, which is a crime against humanity. 83% of the audience score, so that's pretty good. Way to go, audience. The critics, on the other hand, I'm not sure what they were thinking, but that's why we have special guests. And that's why we bring in uh, somebody who we love when they come in and pinch hit for us. They always deliver clever insights. They always deliver well thought out diatribes and with a dash of funny in there and a little bit of taco sometimes. Lon Harris is our, so you, you know him from everything from screen junkies. He's a, he's a schmodown combatant of lore and he's a very talented writer and an amazing follow on social media. Lon Harris, welcome. Wow, what an intro. Thank you, Mark. Jeez, I'm, I'm glowing. <laughs> well, never, I, never has a man received such a such a, a, a lovely and thought out uh, introduction. Well, you know, here's the thing about me and Jacqueline can attest to this. I tend to lean more towards the nice intros when I think I think the guest is going to be like minded with me mm. on the tomato meter, especially about a movie as controversial. I mean, it's right smack dab in the middle. It's fresh adjacent, but it's not. So I got to <laughs> ask you, Spaceballs, is it wrong on the oh, tomato meter? A hundred percent for this movie. And I know that that's not how Rotten Tomatoes works. It's not It's not the quality. It is not <laughs> reflected in the number. That's the number of critics. I understand. But in my heart, this is a hundred percent fresh. This is, it's one of my favorite comedies, largely because I saw it at age eight with my dad and my my family and we, we, we loved it. I watched it obsessively over and over again as a kid. I still have several of these sequences memorized. So yeah, this is a beloved film for me. Uh, I quote it still probably more frequently than an adult should. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you 100% on this one. Oh, uh, Juan, you did such a good job defending your point already, but you fell into that trap that Jacqueline laid for you because you quoted the exact age that you saw it the first time that Jack I and I got into a bar fight over not two weeks ago, talking about how everybody, when they saw it, when they were a kid, loved it. So Jack, when Lon saw it when he was eight and loved it, I probably saw it when I was eight and loved it. Jack, when Coley is Rotten Tomatoes right or wrong? When I was eight, they were so wrong. Oh, no. At 40, <laughs> uh, they kind of right. I'm sorry. Look, okay. Abstractly, I love, love, love Spaceballs. But this is not like a question with other movies where I'm like, I feel like the score is wrong. It's really a great long SNL bit. And if it was done by anybody else besides Mel Brooks, I would call it amazing. But this man gave me History of the World Part One. Mm. This man gave me Young Frankenstein. This, this young man gave me Blazing Saddles and the producers. And this young man is pushing 100, so I'm saying something by calling him a young man. But this is Mel Brooks. 
And as a Mel Brooks fan, as a Mel Brooks stan, it is bottom tier. And I'm sorry to say that. Bottom tier. I am tier. so much a Mel Brooks fan that even I know, I feel like in his parody goddess or parody god-esque way, he's kind of folded in on, on Spaceballs in so many ways. Because okay. it's not a really accurate parody of Star Wars or space operas or anything else. It's just a fun story where you put those skins on top of it. Y'all are going to be so fun. mad at me. I, I, I have some fun so with this. And I, I also, I, I think you're making some good points here. And so we're going to get into this. We're also going to get into like our favorite Mel Brooks movie and where Spaceballs might rank. Um, but before we get into all that, Jacqueline, I'm so jealous of you right now because you get to give us a quick synopsis as to what Spaceballs is about. You told us what it's not about, so what is Spaceballs about? <laughs> Obviously, we know that Spaceballs is a parody of all space movies and operas, but in this one in particular, we are following a more comedic side of it, and we are led by Bill Pullman, who plays our, I guess, lovable rogue Lone Star. This is the Han Solo character, and he has been tasked to bring back the wayward Princess Vespa, who has decided that she does not want to marry her Prince Charming, a very sleepy one at that, but she does not want to marry him and so she absconds and then she is then kidnapped by the evil empire because they're trying to steal the oxygen rights of her planet and they literally are trying to steal it because mel brooks who is president schnoop uh i don't even know how to say it stroop i'm like saying it wrong stroop i'm gonna say it it's the it's the letters of brooks mixed up yeah yeah scroop uh, President Scroop, and he is going to be <laughs> trying to essentially steal these air rights. And so this is the adventure to get the captured princess to bring back the air rights so that they can make sure that the planet does not get destroyed. And then we get a maybe a lost prince story. We learn about the Schwartz, which is their version of the Force. We meet Yogurt, who's essentially Yoda. And we have a grand old time. And Joan Rivers has probably one of the greatest voice performances ever as her version of R2-D2 with her virgin alert. Wow, look at that. What a great, just a nice encapsulation of everything that this movie really is about. We're just trying to save some air from planet Druidia. So we're going to talk a lot <laughs> about space balls, and I cannot yeah. wait to dive into this episode with you all because this has been a requested movie too. So thanks to all of our fans who are telling us you need to cover space balls forever. We're finally doing it for y'all. And right now we turn it over to our good friend, Tim Ryan, who's our expert review curation manager here at Rotten Tomatoes. He's going to tell us what the critics were saying at the time of Spaceballs' release back in 1987. Tim, I hope some of them were eight years old. Two minutes with Tim. My wife and I were at the movies a few years ago when who do we see walking into the theater right behind us but Bill Pullman. Look, my wife said to me, it's Lone Star. And Mr. Pullman heard her, and he cracked a wry smile. I was 10 when Spaceballs was released, and my favorite movie was Star Wars, so I was the exact demographic for Mel Brooks' send-up of big-budget sci-fi. I also hadn't seen Alien yet, so that final scene soared over my head, but I laughed anyway. And I know there were millions more just like me. But for a lot of grown-ups, and certainly a lot of grown-up movie critics, Spaceballs was something of a disappointment. A lot of them felt it was a lowbrow satire that had some decent gags but lacked the wit and incisiveness of the likes of The Producers or Blazing Saddles or Young Frankenstein. Spaceballs is rotten at 56% on the tomato meter with 45 reviews, but it does have an 83% audience score. So what did the critics have to say back in 1987? In a fresh review, Kathy Burke of United Press International wrote, This send-up by director Mel Brooks incorporates the silliest aspects of all the major space adventures of the last decade, and the whole is a hilarious combination of its parts. However, in a rotten review, Richard Schickel of Time Magazine wrote, The crew flings itself energetically through space in search of laughs, but it will never penetrate the galaxy where Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein traced their giddy orbits. The Rotten Tomatoes critics' consensus reads, There's fine spoofery and amusing characters in Spaceballs, though it's a far cry from Mel Brooks' peak era. So that's Spaceballs. Jacqueline, Mark, may the Schwartz be with you. And also with you, Tim. Thank you so much. And so lest we go right to our merchandising point of the podcast, let's go right into movie talk. I want to talk about this movie just in, in context of what Jacqueline sort of opened up in that can of worms where we are looking at this not just as a standalone film, but as part of Mel Brooks's hilarious and amazing canon. So, Lon Harris, do you have an easy answer as to where Spaceballs might rank for you as far as Mel Brooks directed movies go? 
I mean, it's 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 very tough. I think there are some there are some obvious stone cold classics in this filmography, and I noticed like a, a lot of people keep going back to like you're you're obviously comparing it to Blazing Saddles. You're obviously comparing it to Young Frankenstein, legendary iconic movies that inform what we think of as as parody. I will say, I think Spaceballs fits right alongside those in terms of maybe not moment to moment, joke to joke. Like, I, I, I'm not going to say it's as consistently funny, maybe, as like a Blazing Saddles. But I will say, I think that what Mel Brooks does so well in all of his parodies, including Spaceballs, is they really do feel like the movies they're parodying. It doesn't feel like it's just a throwaway, like, and this is not to knock these Zucker Abrams guys or anyone else that came along. But a lot of the time, the idea is it's a parody. It can feel loose. It can feel more like a comedy. It doesn't have to feel like it is actually one of the movies from the genre it's parodying. But if you think about Young Frankenstein, he really makes it feel like a classic universal horror movie. He shoots it that way. He uses the Frankenstein set elements. It, it really, you know, it evokes that era. And I think, it, same with Spaceballs, he actually worked with Lucas and Industrial Light and Magic. He made a deal with Lucas. We won't merchandise the movie. Let us use some of the sets in Industrial Light and Magic. And so it does evoke Star Wars in a way that I think is beyond what you would probably expect from a Mel Brooks movie. And I think that works really well. It, it feels like one of these kinds of stories, even as it's being really zany. Yeah, and, and Jacqueline, I, I do take your point to heart where I feel like Young Frankenstein and Blazing Saddles, like Lon said, are sort of the two goats of Mel Brooks's filmography. And I would put this on a par just below them with The History of the World Part 1 with The Silent Movie, which I think is an underrated classic. And so, High Anxiety, too, I think. I was like, just about right, to say High Anxiety. Yeah, this right. This is that, way worse than terrible. High Anxiety. High Anxiety took those psychological thrillers and understood them. Again, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Well, I'm no, just no, like, I, I, I think we're all kind of making the same point here in that once the 80s hit, and once I think Mel Brooks, first of all, looked at the Zucker Abrams Zucker movies like Airplane and Top Secret, and then you also have this new generation of kids that are watching MTV, I don't think that played a small part in the way that Mel Brooks directed movies. Because if you look at something like Spaceballs, or you look at something like Robin Hood Men in Tights, which some people love, some people are about meh on, Dracula Dead and loving it, all of those movies, starting with Spaceballs, I feel like had more jokes crammed into them than Young Frankenstein and Blazing Saddles, but I feel like every joke in Blazing Saddles and Young Frankenstein is a home run. And I feel like starting with Spaceballs, some of those jokes are home runs. Some of them are just singles. Some of them are just, we're just getting on base. So not everything is a gut buster like you would see in Young Frankenstein, but there's moments in this movie that just murder me. And I want to talk about some of those, but... I, I think we're all in agreement here, Jacqueline, that the 70s Mel Brooks is sort of the gold standard when it comes to spoof movies. Absolutely. And the other thing, too, I will say on this one, I don't want to just criticize it as a spoof because, look, later years, Mel Brooks, Men in Tights definitely was not a spoof that had a great critical reception, but I felt it lived in what it was better mm. than what Spaceballs was. I, again, for everything about Spaceballs that felt so much of what it was and therefore understood what it was, I don't know if this was as timely as it could have been to really spew it. The other thing about Blazing Saddles is it was contemporary with the actual Western sort of, I would say, peak in, the, in a lot of ways. So you had people looking at Blazing Saddles along the last sort of bastion of the grand American John Wayne Western industry of movies that was going on at the time. And so it felt so close to it. Meanwhile, having a such a commercial Star Wars parody that really talked about the industry's obsession with Star Wars more than it actually talked about the events of anything that you wanted to parody <laughs> within Star Wars is my problem. Like, I feel like the parody in Star Wars is just not an interesting parody because it's really just spoofing it's really taking politics in the movie industry and putting it under the skin of a space movie and having that be what it's really parodying. It's not really parodying, in my opinion, Star Wars. And so therefore it's like a little it takes, weak. I think it takes a lot more liberties with the characterizations because Lone Star is kind of Han Solo and Luke Skywalker sort of wrapped into one, you know? Exactly. And, and, and the and, antithesis of that is the problem. That means that they really didn't understand the why those two characters were separate. And by putting them together, they kind of, set up the character to fail. Yeah, but we're also spoofing a, an entire trilogy where we just want to have some laughs with one movie here, Lon. You and can do that. Yeah. Family and Guy did it very well. 
And it's not a one to one. I mean, I think that's the other thing I would say is it's not just this is Mel Brooks's Star Wars parody. It's a parody True. of the whole genre and, and a lot of 70s and 80s sci fi. And we do get Alien. We do get Star Trek. We do get Planet of the Apes where there's a lot of it's sort of Mel, Mel Brooks's attempt to like take on the entire sci fi space opera fantasy in space kind of idea. And I think it, it works pretty well. The one other thing I was going to say in its defense is uh, a lot of the classic Mel Brooks movies are his original cast of collaborators that he worked with all the time. You're, and Dom DeLuise is in this. He's Pizza the Hut. But yeah. uh, and Cloris Leachman, <laughs> of course, is, you know, we we, we uh, but yeah, like the, the, the Cloris Leachman, Harvey Corman, all those people that were Gene Wilder that were filling in those original films. This is him working with, you know, the next generation, people who grew up watching his original stuff. And I think he acquits himself really well and gets some classic performances. We've mentioned Bill Pullman, John Candy, Rick Moranis, like a lot of the great comic sort of voices of that that era, he managed to kind of bring to the forefront and give them fun classic roles to play as well. No, and the thing fair. that I always go back to is that I find Spaceballs to be enjoyable and I like a lot of the jokes when we're following the adventures of Bill Pullman, uh, his character Lone Star, and Barf, and and Daphne Zuniga's Princess Vespa, all yeah. that good stuff. However, the Imperial stuff, the Empire stuff, everything with Dark Helmet and Colonel Sanders yeah. kills me. I am on the floor howling when I'm watching the evil parts of this movie because there is just an unmitigated genius at work who thinks, who am I going to cast to play my big bad Darth Vader? Rick Moranis, the funny short yeah. guy. I'm going to put him being overwhelmed constantly in this giant suit. The dark helmet suit has a tie. It has yeah. a tie. <laughs> and it's just all those little kind of gags. And I'll tell you right now, my favorite gag in this entire movie as of today my favorite visual gag is when we're searching for our heroes the the empire is searching for our heroes and they're on the desert planet and so dark helmet has his khaki safari dark helmet yeah. suit <laughs> it is because he's got shorts on and he's got mm -hmm. like the khaki colored helmet instead it is an amazing visual gag i've sent the troops on ahead to vector 78 sir good let's get moving yes sir driver prepare to move out what are you preparing? You're always preparing. Just go. Just go. Yes, sir. Sir, shouldn't you sit down? And Mark, but and this is producer Lucy here. Hi, Lucy. It's not just a tie. It's a it's a penis. Did you notice that? It, it does. It's it has two little circles. yeah. There's, there's two little epaulets <laughs> yeah, like right here next tie. to the tie. I never <laughs> noticed that that was literally a dick tie. Oh yeah. I, I mean that's also worth noting. Wow. Is it, it is a movie that if you only watched it as a child, it really does reward going back at least once as an adult because there are a lot of jokes that I promise you went right over your head when you were a kid. I also, uh, uh, I did not get the alien. I, I saw this before I saw Alien. So I didn't get the presence of John Hurd uh, showing up <laughs> in that scene either. But yeah, there's a lot of just like dirty jokes and Borscht Belt kind of material that was flying right over eight-year-old me's head when I first saw it. Yeah. Including the, the penis well tie. Look, and I don't want to like hate on this. I love Spaceballs so much. <laughs> I just don't think like when I look back on it, I like, you know, like I went back this weekend and I like, you know, watched the first hour, watched, you know, a few key scenes. And I'm like, yeah, because I've seen it, like Lon said, um, <laughs> at least 50 times, probably more. Like definitely <laughs> I'm your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. Former roommate. Yeah. Thank well you. Well played. So... I definitely got this, but it's it's just I don't know how to put it. It wasn't all it didn't it wasn't all jelly. It didn't all like like hit me in the right places. But I will agree with you, Mark. Anytime they're in the white, what I like to call space void of the like deck, like the holodeck area, or, like you know that oh, I'm with you. God, it is so it is good. all yeah. good. And I do love like the Lone Star Barf storyline and everything that they do together. But it just doesn't make a whole movie. And I think what you s said, Lon, is true. They tried to parody too much in this movie. And that's they, why they, it doesn't they, work for me. They, they did bite off a lot. And so I I want to I want to go go to Lon first on this one. Lon, who's the character? Because I'll, I'll take Dark Helmet, which you're welcome to draft as well. Who's the character that you find yourself following for the jokes? That you find yourself following for the story, if you want to? Who's your favorite character out of Spaceballs? 
Uh, I mean, I think, yeah, definitely as a kid, I was a huge Rick Moranis fan even before this. Like, he was already one of my favorite presences in a movie. So that was a big part of the reason I even wanted to see this. I don't even think I necessarily would have known Mel Brooks at this point. It was really Rick Moranis. So so Dark Helmet for sure. But also, uh, I would have to say, yeah, Barf, I think, is like a cornerstone character for me. Uh, and, 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 you know, John Candy managed to find ways to make these characters who were gross and the jokes were raunchy and crass, but it's it's so lovable. There's this warm humanity underneath it all, even though he's playing this ridiculous mog, half man, half dog character uh, that that Candy could always find. And I think he's he's like the the emotional center of the movie, if you will. The line that he has that that flew over my head most of the time as a kid, so I needed to watch this fifty times to really like find that line and realize how funny it is, is towards the end when Lone Star is going to leave his ship, the Winnebago, so he can sneak in and go confront Dark Helmet. And so he says, I'm going in there. And Barf says, he's going in there. in there. I wouldn't. <laughs> it's just a pause. <laughs> like, what's he doing? Uh, Jacqueline, you're, you mentioned you also love Joan Rivers in this movie. So mm, who is the yes. character that, that Jacqueline Coley gloms on to? Oh, absolutely. Joan, like, first of all, I was somebody that watched Fashion Police before we realized how cringe it was. Like, I love Joan Rivers. One of the reasons why I love Hacks and signed up for it before I even knew who was involved was because mm. it was about her. And that is such a great voice performance. And like, I really want to key into this one. She was the perfect thing to have like this version of a princess, have that be her absolute sort of like, like she's literally playing like a Yentl type, you know, the Jewish, like, ah, I got to fuss over you here and fuss over you there because we're trying to get you married off. And the Virgin Alert, the comedy of that, that is probably one of my favorite laughs. No, mister, you stay over there. <laughs> the Virgin Alert is an all time gag yeah. in this. What's the joke, though, that like, was there a joke that you saw when you were a kid, Jacqueline, and, and you're like, that's the funniest thing in this movie. And then you grow up and you're like, no, no, no. Now this is the funniest thing. Honestly, movie, as a kid, it was getting jammed because yes. I thought that getting jammed was really jam. I really did. Like, I, I, I was like, is that what it means? <laughs> no man would dare give me the raspberry. Uh, yeah, I really did think that jamming was jam. And it was so funny because I had a family member at the time that was on a sub. And I was like asking them, it's like, is that how they like lose y'all? And he was like, no. I was so serious because when you do sub duty, people don't tell you this about sub duty. Um, there's like points where like they're just not in communication. Like yeah. they're just kind of like gone and you can't talk to them. You can't get anything to them. Like they the, obviously, I guess the, the military knows kind of where they are, but you can't talk to them. They have to like surface for them to get messages and all that. And so I was like, is that what happens when you can't talk on the sub for three days? He's like, no, that means that there's a Russian warhead or something. Above. It's not actual. <laughs> preserves fruit <laughs> yeah so well, anyway. am i crazy or does pizza the hut actually look delicious yeah no it's a it's a it's a weirdly appetizing because uh, <laughs> they made the cheese like realistically droopy and the and, like, pepperonis are falling yeah. off just like a nice hot cheese pi it really I looks eat like it. melting cheese it's funny yeah. too that his the guy who's with Pizza the Hut, his sort of spokesman, is is a Max Headroom parody. Which That's what I was to just our, about to say. Like, it goes again. back to our, they're trying to take on like everything sci-fi in the 1980s, whether it was in outer space or not even. You guys, he looks like a pustule. He looks like a gross, like, zit thing that's but just the one leaking. Guy ate him, and he looked like he liked <laughs> yeah. to eat him. Because, so I'm not going to lie to you. It's sort of like once you see the video of the idiot eating Tide Pods, you want to eat it. It's not like you think that it tastes good, but they looked like they were having such a fun time doing it. The other thing I'll add about the Max Headroom guys, that's what I will get to on Spaceballs. They weren't just parroting sci-fi action genre, all of that space stuff. They were also parroting the MTV generation. And they were parroting yep. this very commercialistic approach to both filmmaking and movie consumption that was being sort of like epitomized in the 80s with movies like Die Hard and things like that. And this movie really, I think, keyed in on that early too with a lot of the merchandising yeah. stuff and like the empire looked more like studio systems at the time. Yeah. This is back when, you know, people like, you know, Katzenberg and this is the Donnie Simpson early Jerry Bruckheimer days where apparently if you read the books, those guys were just high on cocaine and big ideas. They didn't have anything going on. <laughs> uh, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a great sequence that I think touches on exactly this that uh, I think 
also, it, it feels m- more modern than a lot of late 80s comedy, which is when they get the video cassette of Spaceballs the movie and watch it during the movie, which is this weird, it's like a very post postmodern, like yes. contemporary meta sort of joke. Like you could almost imagine like Space Jam, A New Legacy or something having that scene of like, let's stop the movie and like fast forward and find out what we're supposed to do next. Mm-hmm. And I really feel like, yeah, Mel Brooks was like a, like a decade ahead with that stuff. Yeah, a decade ahead, because I think he was frustrated. One thing I will know studying directors of his ilk at a certain time, it's like when you look at um, uh, John uh, Hudson towards the end of his career, Billy Wilder towards the end of his career, they get very, I would say, disillusioned with uh, the system. And I feel like this was his I'm disillusioned with the system movie. And I will also give a big shout out to to a character who does not get their due as far as their comedic value in this film. And that is George Weiner's performance as Colonel Sanders, who is sort of the right hand of Dark Helmet. And one of my favorite sequences, I, I love just how Dark Helmet is this big bad. But then as soon as he just lifts his faceplate up. He's just this weak little kid who and and the scene where Colonel Sanders walks in on <laughs> Dark Helmet playing with his toys and you get to see just who really any evil genius is at heart where they just want to be loved. They just want to get the girl at the end of the day. And so he walks in on him playing with his dolls and he says, no, sir, I didn't see you playing with your dolls again. Oh, leave me alone. No, kiss me. No, no, yes, no, no, yes, no, yes. Oh, 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 your helmet is so big. Lord Helmet, what? You need it on the bridge, sir. Knock on my door. Knock next time. Yes, sir. Did you see anything? No, sir. I didn't see you playing with your dolls again. Good. And then you also have another sequence where they feel like they've captured Princess Vespa. And it's basically Dark Helmet talking trash about her to her thinking she's in the car. And when she's not, his first reaction is to open his faceplate and just whine. She's not in there. And it just works so well as the toughest bad guy in the galaxy suddenly becoming the weakest person on the ship. I I cannot get enough of that juxtaposition. I do think there are a lot of gags that do kind of express what we're what we're sort of saying, which is just like the exhaustion of making movies in the late 80s as opposed to when he first started making movies and it was more like get a bunch of funny people together and kind of figure it out what you're going to do. Uh, like sequences like the endless special effect of the ship where it never, it's just this model that you're never so good. through with that it just keeps going and going. Or uh, the you've captured their stunt doubles sequence where it's like all these action scenes and it's not even your actors. It's like some guy with a mustache smoking a stogie pretending to be a Princess Vespa. And I think there, there is a lot of that kind of material in it of just like, Movies used to be about stories and characters and jokes, and now they're about visual effects and budgets and these like huge, epic, sprawling tentpole ideas. This was a turning point, though, I feel like for spoof films in general, because once we got into this came out in 1987, once we got into the 90s and then even going through like the scary movie era, which I know a lot of people appreciate, then you had another not another teen movie. And it seemed like it wasn't about the story at all. It, it became about a loose premise like, oh, we're going to make this about horror movies and then we're just going to put a bunch of pop culture references in here. There's some pop culture references like we talked about Pizza the Hut's second in command is just like Max Headroom from the 1980s from those Coke commercials. But I wonder if there's something to that because I've never felt like a spoof movie has made me laugh if I saw it for the first time as an adult. And I can't differentiate if that's because I am too old to enjoy it where spoof movies have to get you when you're a kid so that you'll love them forever, or if spoof movies just aren't as good as they used to be. Lon Harris, any insight on Hmm. that? I mean, I'm trying to think. I I definitely don't like spoof movies as much as I once did, but there's definitely, like, I I think there are films that at least are circling that genre that I would still enjoy. I mean, I would think uh, Black Dynamite is the first one that pops into my head as, like, an Mm. obvious counterpoint. Like, I was a grown man when I watched Black Dynamite. And I love that movie. I think it's hilarious. But I think even like to kind of go back to the meta point, like stuff like the Chippendales Rescue Rangers movie this year, like we don't maybe think of it as a spoof movie specifically because it's not like it's like, you know, it's not like what Hot Shots is doing to Top Gun 
where it's like a one to one. But it is a spoof of all of those like. James Marsden has to go on a road trip with Sonic the Hedgehog type movies. Like it is kind of riffing on that whole idea of like the hybrid animation live action stuff. So, you know, I mean, I, I think it's still it's still viable, even if it's not. Maybe I don't love it the way I did when Naked Gun was still an active property. That's a great point you make. Jack, do you feel like spoof movies are, are just better suited for kids? And then once you grow up, it's like never, never land. You just can't go back. No, yes and no. Look, I do feel like there's always this thing with like when you see something, is your page full? It's this idea of like when you're a kid, your page is empty and anything that you find, the minute you find Star Wars, it can take up the whole page. As you get to be like 40 plus, there's a lot of things already on the page. Nothing is coming that's going to rival the Washington Redskins on your page, Mark. So I would say that with parodies. (laughs) After a certain point, especially if you're looking at Mel Brooks's filmography, what's left on the page to top that? I just think parody has a different place now. It is less about this and it is more about parodying, I think, themes and stuff. Like I look at Boys as a great parody. You just don't know that it's a parody. That's a great um, call, too. Uh, yeah. Starship Troopers is a parody. And so it's not that parodies have changed. They're just... It's like horror. You're going to have to subvert the expectations of what's being parodied because what's considered shocking moves with every generation. And this generation, I'm just uh, because I remember we did a review, uh, like a classic review of Spaceballs for Schmoes. And like a lot of the the responses, like the comments we got were I'm just, you know, I was born in 1995 or whatever. And like I just. I go back and I watch this movie and it just, just doesn't really hit me the same way. And and in my elitist brain, because I was born in 1980, I'm like, how could you not? How could you not get it? But I, I, I understand sometimes it is just tough to go back and put yourself in that time capsule. But because we were all somewhat alive and, and, and were cognizant around the time that Spaceballs came out, maybe it is just something that our childhood it, like, just picked up and just never let go. I do wonder what it was like to be a critic at that time, though. Who, because that's really the confounding thing to me is is that critics of the time saw it and didn't think it was it was funny. Maybe they just didn't think it lived up to the other Mel Brooks movies of the seventies, Jack. When maybe that's that's to your point up top. Yeah, I mean, it's not even so much that it didn't live up because I would say you can't look at Men in Tights and say that it anyway compares to Raising Saddle. But I do found no. that he found ways to be inventive with his collaborators at that point, inventive with maybe the types of stuff he was doing before later when he, you know, sort of semi-retired. But even like doing the producers on Broadway, he was very involved in that revamp. And then the producers, uh, the the movie adaptation. So I just feel like... He had his moments in in the sun. He still could have more moments because if folks don't know, History of the World Part Two, the series is coming. It's a joke 40 years in the making. Uh, But I would just say, like, again, I think he's doing it on television, which is going to help. And hopefully he takes he looks at things like the boys. He looks at things like Starship Troopers. He looks at things like Veep and in the thick of it and makes a balance a little bit differently between, you know, again, the parody and, and the reality. I do think you can still find humor and, fun and and comedy and parody as an adult. It just can't be kid jokes. Most parodies are kid jokes. Look, we it's lampshade jokes. It's like, look, this is Luke Skywalker, but we made him funny. <laughs> I, I mean, I think we also did like there there was this and I don't want to beat up. I don't even remember Freiburg and one other name, Seltzer or whatever. There there were the like the the, the scary movie, epic movie, date movie guys And that, I feel like, gave kind of the genre a bad name. And it was very much the lazy kind of jokes where it's like, just have Jigsaw show up. Like, what are you doing here, Jigsaw? You're not in this scene. And uh, where it's like references instead of jokes. And I think it kind of gave the spoof movie a bad name. Yeah. And and so now, I was just going to say, now I feel like, a lot of those kinds of jokes and a lot of the the parody spoof idea still exists. I mean, the Scream franchise is like the biggest thing in horror. It's just they're baked into the other movies. They're not standalone. This movie only exists to be a spoof. Yeah. The only thing I was going to add to that is I will not take any shade on Keeney Ivory Reigns and Scary Movie, but anything that was like past that, it was, when you that get was into, the, yeah, right. like that, the, the second tier versions where it was like Sparta movies right. or like yeah, meet the Spartans. I believe meet, yeah. the, meet the Spartans, Spartans was the one for me where, where I think I was able to pinpoint why I don't like these kind of movies anymore is because I, I think I said at the time it was like, 
Us Weekly made a movie where, like, Meet the Spartans, there's no good reason why there should be a Britney Spears' bald joke in a movie called Meet the Spartans when you're parodying 300. But it's there, and it's like, what are we even doing with this stuff anymore? I will give love to, to the Scary Movie franchise, though, simply because of the the, the bloodline that they come from with, the, I'm going to get you suck I'm in, gonna get in you living suck color. I'm going to get you a classic. And, yeah, and, uh, yeah don't, uh, don't be a menace on the streets of South Central uh, while drinking your juice in the Don't be a menace in the society, yeah. yeah. And, but this and is the thing, compare the dogma, two. Dogma's like that too, though. Be, be, Kevin Smith actually has a lot of spoof DNA as well. I mean, it, it's just basically a skewering of religion in general. And then there's a story we're following, but the buddy Jesus from Dogma seems like something that you could have put into Outer Space and Spaceballs. I have one quick interjection here because you brought up like the 90s kid because I had yeah. this experience, Mark. So like Lon, like all of you, I saw it as soon as I could. I, I was born in 90 and then I probably saw it like eight years later. So I was probably also eight years old because this is my dad's religion. You know, like <laughs> there's our no number Brooks. again. Yeah, there we go. And um, so I saw it later. This was a movie that we watched, I don't know, 17 times a year. It was naughty. So I got to like it was one of those movies where I had to kind of sneak away from my mom. But like my dad and I would watch it. Loved it so much. Watched it for the first time in like I don't know, 20 something years last night. And the experience was interesting because, well, first off, Jacqueline, to your point, my husband was like, this is like a long SNL skit. He did not like it. And for me, it changed. It was no longer this like magical, naughty sort of forbidden fruit sort of movie to watch, but I still loved it. And the jokes that I was laughing at were not the jokes I was laughing at then. I was telling you guys beforehand, the joke, one of the jokes that made me laugh out loud, <laughs> I don't even know if it's that funny, is when Bill Pullman's in the desert and they've crash landed to get away from the, the empire, so to speak. And he's pissed off about the giant hair dryer. Yes. And he's like, Industrial strength hair dryer. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, You're ugly when you're angry. And it made me laugh so hard. But back then, I didn't give two shits about that joke. So it's just this. I'm, I'm going to show it to my kids. I, I still love it. I do think it's a little bit slow for my 2022 ADD brain because I'm so used to that kind of quick, fast humors, and it just felt kind of slow, but I still love it. It's just different now. You and know? The, end, the, the, the end still works on a different level for me because I'd never seen Planet of the Apes before I saw Spaceballs, and so I just thought it was funny that the thing turned the ship turned into like a statue of liberty almost kind of knock off and it crash lands and it i think it's a it turns into a giant space maid and then it yeah. crash well, lands she's vacuuming up the oxygen the air, from yeah. planet right. druidia and yeah. then and, it, and they're only in the head because right. like it's like they don't get out and so they're just like yeah that was that's a great countdown again there's so many great movies in this i feel like i'm gonna be like the bad person that's down on it i'm not i just I understand. Like, I get why this wasn't well received at the time. I get why it hasn't necessarily risen up in people's estimation. I think people like Spaceballs, but is this a movie that people are like, this is an injustice? I mean, I think you, you have to be in an age, if you're in an age range, if you were born between like 77 and 82, you're like, this is an outrage. And I think everybody else like accepts that it was just a comedy. But here's the thing. It's and it goes back to like the conversation we always have around the Oscars where we especially comics don't feel like they reward comedies enough. But it, the critics have really warmed up to the Jackass movies over time. Yes. Jackass Forever is fresh. And yeah. I feel like critics certified are finally like fresh. Hey, certified fresh. So I feel like the critics are finally like, hey, um, what is Jackass trying to do? And did it succeed at it? And the answer is yes. I just feel like, what is Spaceballs trying to do? Is it trying to tell you a coherent story? No, it's just, Mel Brooks is just, he's hes a comedian. He's just trying to make you laugh hard every 15 seconds. That's his only goal. And I feel like Spaceballs achieved that. And so much like our podcast helped influence Sister Act 2 to get that <laughs> up the tomato meter to prominence, my goal for this entire show has always been just get Spaceballs into fresh territory. It was up to 59% at one point. It's down to 56%. Come on, critics. I know you're out there. See Spaceballs, review it, and maybe, hopefully, you'll feel more like Lon and I than Jacqueline, although it seems like Jacqueline and Producey Lucy enjoyed this movie. Our engineer, Brian Perez, I have different thoughts about him. So um, last thing here before we go to Mailbag is I have a Spaceballs trivia question that I and only I can ask. And don't get your hopes up because you're probably going to be disappointed. Is everybody ready? 
I'm ready. It's got a great soundtrack, right? We hear Bon Jovi's Raise Your Hands when we meet the mm-hmm. Winnebago for the first time. Sure. Can anybody name the Van Halen song very briefly used in Spaceballs? Can you at least tell me like when in the movie it happened? I will tell you exactly when it happens. Thanks for asking, Jacqueline. He's, it he's is... got the two women in the bed, right? President Scrooge is in bed and he, somebody calls in on the on the wall. Isn't that the that scene or am I wrong? It is not that scene. Oh. It is, is it the John scene? Hurt alien oh. scene. It's when oh. they walk into the diner. When Lone Star and Barf walk hmm. into that space diner, you hear the wails of Sammy Hagar and his very first Van Halen song on the very first Van Halen album he did say, oh, wow. hello, baby. It's oh, Get right. Up. Yeah. Yeah. It's what? Jacqueline just entered her song mind is, palace. The song is Get <laughs> Up. I do remember No, Jacqueline that entered there, lean back and see if I can Google this real quick without Mark yeah, noticing. It goes, hello, <laughs> baby. That's all you hear, and then you hear the riff, the, yeah. oh, the guitar yeah. note, and then it's cuts. You're right. And, you're and right. then we go but into there that. Is a, there is a hard rock song that plays in the other scene I'm thinking of. I just can't. It's like Motley Crue or something. There is. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there certainly is. President Scrooge, um, you know, he's uh, like a lot of politicians. He really enjoys he's, his at, he's like, I told you never to call me on this wall. This is an unlisted <laughs> wall. <laughs> my, my brother and I still say that to each other all the time. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I mean. So there's so many little little funny bits and moments. I have a question, Mark. Will it affect our friendship if I tell you I don't think I can name five Van Halen songs? I can name five, oh, wow. but barely five. I bet you can. I think you. I mean, well, it's going to affect our friendship if you don't at least try right now. Okay, hot for teacher. Yes. Jump. Nailed Panama. it. Panama. You're crushing 1984. Here we go. Wait, 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 wait. This is where it gets difficult. Hold on. Um. Wait, wait. Crystal I got Pepsi. one. I got one. I got one. Uh, right now. <laughs> thank you, right thank now. you, Mom. Hey. <laughs> Go tomorrow. Go tomorrow. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know see. you. I know you can get this. Uh, yeah. There's, there's, there's a few more um, pretty prominent. Come on, ones. Van Halen. Who does Van Halen like to like to jog with in the morning, <laughs> or run with? Sneakers. Run with the devil. Oh, run with the devil. Oh, okay, yeah. running with the devil. Was, there you go. There you go. Okay. Jacqueline sorry. has done the impossible, and she's named five Van Halen songs. And a friendship <laughs> and a podcast co-hosting relationship has been restored. This Brian, is what the problem is. I was going to name all of the songs of the people, the solo artists. So I was like, California Girls. Uh, no, that extra, more 55. than words. No, I can't drive count, 55. Yeah. Like, okay. I was like, Could oh, those are all it. not Van yeah. Halen songs. Brian, it's, all, it's uh, the, the, the helium's falling out of the balloon now. Hit I know, the music I know. But I got it. I got five. I got to five. I got to five. I love professional that Brian Perez is. He's like, I'm going to wait until these morons shut up. But then he's just like, you know what? It, it, this is as good a time as any. Just go ahead and hit this. Because and- he knows if you were talking about Van Halen, it could last six hours. You are not as- going to be the one to turn that faucet off. He has had to deal with that more times than he'd like to remember. So <laughs> we can always accept emails. Why? Because we have an email address. It's RT is wrong at Rotten Tomatoes dot com. Email us anytime with your thoughts, with what movies you want us to be talking about. We'll throw some TV shows in there as well. Books, uh, maybe a different podcast. So Michael Galvin Ali writes us, and he's a fresh member of the Ketchup Crew. Says, hi, Rotten Tomatoes. Please review Batman Forever from 1995. Mm. The movie was fun and campy. Jim Carrey's portrayal as the Riddler was funny. Val Kilmer did a good job playing Batman and Chris O'Donnell as Dick Grayson and Robin didn't disappoint. I could care less about Tommy Lee Jones as Two-Face and Nicole Kidman as Dr. Chase Meridian as Batman's love interest. I just turned 13 years old that week when the movie came out. Looking back at that movie coming out in 1995, it's still fun and still campy. Jim Carrey stole the whole movie as the Riddler. Thank you, Michael Lee of the Michael Galvin Ali Show. So check out the Michael Galvin Ali Show. And uh, yeah, the Batman... Forever, I was, I think, not quite 15 when that movie came out. And that was the movie I was pinning my hopes on this summer. Walked in with a lot of expectations. I walked out as U2 blared. And I was like, I'm not sure what I just saw. Lon Harris, you got fond memories of Batman Forever. I did not like it when I saw it. I, I loved the Burton version of Gotham. I loved Batman Returns. I was hoping for more of that. And then it was this like colorful, sort of campy, goofy, more like the 60s show. And I was not into it. Yeah. But in in subsequent years going back, I now enjoy it a lot. And if you put yourself in a different frame of mind, it's a lot of fun. I love Nicole Kidman as Dr. Chase Meridian. I think she's actually one of the highlights of that whole movie. And those scenes with her and Val Kilmer are like, 
that's like the best Schumacher Batman stuff, I think. Uh, I agree about Tommy Lee Jones, though. It's 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 all Jim Carrey. Tommy Lee Jones kind of doesn't find his voice, or he doesn't get Two Face. I don't think or doesn't care. So that and feels kind of throwaway. Doesn't enjoy Jim Carrey's buffoonery. He no, cannot and you sanction could, it. I feel like you could kind of tell his just his heart's not into it. It's it's not one of his better sort of '90s turns. But He's overall, like, I just I, won I an Oscar. He's yeah. like, I was I was just the guy in the fugitive. Now what yeah. the hell am I doing, Jacqueline? Are we gonna have words about Batman Forever? Or where do you find it? Actually, what's weird is Batman Forever is one of those movies where if I could cherry pick certain things about it, it would be like num, 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 num. And then other things about it would make me nauseous. So I actually really enjoyed Val Kilmer. I think he actually does yeah. the Bruce Wayne aloof billionaire as well as he's able to do the the Batman stuff. And he was one of the few people that could be believable in both of those little aspects of it. Doesn't make him a great Batman, but I really enjoyed him. And Poison Ivy, well, not Poison Ivy. Yeah. Is that Poison Ivy? Forever that's ba- that's, that's Batman, Batman and Robin. And Robin. No, no. Batman Forever is just Tommy Lee Jones and the Riddler. Right. Yeah, no. Jim Carrey is the one that that stole it in that one. Yeah, I just Jim remember Carrey. being yeah. so bummed that uh, they didn't keep the Danny Elfman score. That there's yeah. like there's a couple notes of it, but it's not the cool Gotham score that you want. So I was like, what the hell are we doing here? But that well, YouTube song Well, Danny Elfman ain't going to work with anybody besides Tim Burton. And huh? you're, you're, you keep mentioning Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me, a great song. This is yeah. also the, the Kiss from a Rose. This uh, is Kiss from a Rose, yeah, yes. That was right. the other thing I wanted to steal is this the soundtrack the for this. That, yeah, the soundtrack the- for this d- gave me what I expected from the Prince album on the first Batman, mm-hmm. which I didn't get. Yeah. There's a great two or three songs from that Prince album on Batman. Ooh, yeah, Party Man album. is great. Party but yeah. really the great. rest of the album is very, there's a lot of skips in that album. But the Batman Forever soundtrack, all bops, no skips. Man, look at Michael just opening up the floodgates here with our opinions on <laughs> Batman Forever. That might have to be a future episode. Thank you, Michael. Um, so we're going to say goodnight here. And I don't know that we solved the Spaceballs conundrum. I just hope that we reminded critics out there who have not yet reviewed Spaceballs that it needs your help. We need your positive reviews. I will tell for Spaceballs to get into fresh territory. Lon Harris, it is always a pleasure when you lend your comedic wit and your intelligent insight into our silly little conversations. Uh, what are you working on? Where can all the kids find you out there? Uh, well, follow me on Twitter. That's at L-O-N-S. That's the best place to keep up with everything I'm doing. Of course, I, I write Honest Trailers, or I'm one of the writers of Honest Trailers. You can check those out every week on Screen Junkies on YouTube. And uh, check out my podcast with Hal Rednick. We watch streaming shows every week and then yell about what we thought about them. It's called Binge Boys, and you can find that on Spotify, uh, you know, Apple, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Binge Boys, a little bit of a spoofy name. Just a, just a, a you know, like, a dash of waking also and nodding. sincere. We are, we are in fact boys who binge, but you know, we're having fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like I said, well, you can email us rtswrong at rottentomatoes.com. Subscribe, rate, review, share, do all that good stuff. Well, do you have any recommendations since you are a binge boy um, mm. that you maybe think all the kids out there should be checking out right now? Just generally, like, what's on TV right now. I've really been enjoying uh, The Old Man, that FX Hulu series with Jeff Bridges and John Lithgow. Great uh, dogs. It is, it's lot good, good dog stuff in that. It's very much like a conventional, like, you know, old retired operative got to come out of hiding one last mission, you know, back on the run. Uh, it's just it's so good. It, it's doing a really good job of being that. Uh, and John Watts, who does the, the Spider-Man films, directed the first two episodes and really nailed it. Looks looks great. So uh, have you I checked out the old that. man at all yet, Jacqueline? The old man is the yes, Jeff Bridges. I saw the pilot. Yeah. I saw the pilot episode of that one, and I haven't seen past it because it was like that under the banner moon, and then the the show with Josh Brolin that came out. Outer range. Outer range, all at the same time. And like, I couldn't catch up on all of them because right now I'm catching up on the stuff for Emmys. But the first episode, the pilot was amazing. Also, Sissy Spacek in J.K. Simmons. uh, Night Sky. uh, Night Sky. Like I, I, like I basically, that one a lot too. That's yeah, also I put great. all four of those in what I like to call things I will watch to maybe recommend to other people in my life who I know will dig it the best. My Damn. Yellowstone friends, as I like to say, and that that old man I heard is like definitely one of those. I'm in oh, the yeah. old man. Recommend the old man to all of your Yellowstone loving friends for sure. That's what I'm like with. 
I fall asleep watching Yellowstone. I want to love it. I just fall asleep How dare you. every episode. Yeah. But the old man, I'm locked in in my <laughs> yeah. head canon that John Lithgow is playing the same role he did as the dad in Harry and the Hendersons. And he called Jeff Bridges' <laughs> character to make Harry disappear once and for all. And that is what they're trying to yeah. cover up. It, did you it know ends this up is, not being the plot. This is the first time those two have ever worked together. Is that crazy? It feels yeah. like they should yes. have been making so movies good. together. But they, no. It does, but if you really think about it, they both fill the same role in a lot yeah. of things. They're either the mm. guy or they're the guy that's helping the girl. Yeah. And if they're not one of those two characters, <laughs> they don't have a reason to be in the movie together. And so it, yeah. you, you feel what I'm saying? No, I like, do. Right. They, they're, they're like a good, like the heavy, you know, like, so if you already have one heavy, you don't need a second heavy. I agree. Two heavies. Did we just see Franny pop in here with a wig? I'm so sorry. I'm not letting that pass by. Lucy's daughter just popped in in a wig. A blue wig. Yep. There it is. There it is. Well, it can only go downhill from here. So I guess we're going to say thank you and yes. good night to all of our incredible listeners. We got a big, big episode next week. Jacqueline, tell the kids about it. Yes, folks. Can y'all count this high? Because we're going this high. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. 100 episodes. Our 100 episode special where we're going to talk about what you guys have been saying, what videos you've been sending in. Very, very, very excited. Mm. And Juan's been a uh, charter member of a few of those episodes. So thank you for his service. And we will continue to lean on him to give us smart things he's going to say about movies and maybe stream. Maybe we'll do the old man someday. It should be fun. But after we get through Batman forever, obviously. So, uh, yeah, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, next week's going to be a very exciting time for us to coronate 100 episodes. That means you're doing something right. So in the meantime, I'll shut up and let us all start marinating in that gory that's Jacqueline Coley, my co-host. That's Lon Harris, our esteemed guest. That is Producey Lucy. That is Producey Lucy's daughter with the blue hair. And Brian Perez, who has thoughts on space balls that I'm glad we're not sharing during this episode. Sorry, Brian. I am merely Mark Ellis. Thanks for listening to Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. May the Schwartz be with you. 